Hello, I'm Scott Wayne. I'm one of the co-moderators for the Nazca virtual series. We are broadcasting from the Richmond, Virginia studios right now, but we're dialed into Denver, Colorado for our first micro review, which is with the state of Colorado around their employer of choice program. Now we would have loved to have been in person, but it is election week on the week that we're filming. And things are a little busy in state capitals right now. So we've decided to do this one remotely and turn it into more of a discussion, uh, a gritty discussion, around how we drove this program through uh, in Denver and the state of Colorado. So many of you will know Cara, hello Cara. Let's just set the scene. What is this Employee of Choice Initiative and why does it matter? Sure, so the Employer of Choice Initiative was actually something uh, I talked to Governor Polis about in my interview. And one of the things he is very proud about and interested in is how do we make the state an employer of choice, a place where employees and applicants want to come to work. So we set forth thinking about how to come up with that plan. And we could have sat at our desks and got our great uh, minds together and came up with a plan. But the first step we did is we went out to talk to employees. That was the first step to understand um, why they came to the state, what benefit they'd like to see, what would they like to see us change and why do they stay? Um, we then, had our teams reach out to other states and other large governments and other private sectors to understand best practices. And then we worked with the other agencies in developing our strategic plan. So really it's a vision with a strategic plan, a three-year strategic plan behind it about how do we become that place that people want to come to work. Okay, so you receive the mandate from Governor Polis, but then who's doing the actual work to make this happen? Perfect. Well, I have three people with me uh, that are really working hard to make this work. The strategic plan has three sections in it, and each of these people are responsible for one. So the sections are around compensation, talent and growth, equity, diversity, inclusion, health, safety, and well-being, recruiting and hiring, and work perks, which also has flexible work or remote work in it. Um, we started this process in uh, 2019, so a lot has changed, but if I may uh, tee up some of the people that have been working on this group to give you an idea of what they did to come up with that portion of the strategic plan. Maybe I will start with John Bartley. Sure, thanks, Cara. Yeah, well, what was really exciting about the approach to the employer of choice listening sessions is that we came out of that with so much information and so much data and some really clear messages from employees, clear trends that we ultimately were able to group into the six different um, initiative areas. And, and one of them was equity, diversity and inclusion. I mean, I think one of the, um, one of the lucky things for me at least as I um, took lead on that initiative was that there were already several structures in place at the state um, that brought together uh, agencies and other thought leaders together to talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion. So an example of that is the Colorado Equity Alliance, which was made up of um, agency HR leaders or deputy directors um, and members of the community who are coming together to talk about how state government could be a more equitable, uh, diverse, and inclusive um, employer. And there were a couple of subcommittees uh, with, that were formed. One of them was around hiring and retention. So there was this perfect marriage between that structure and the data that we were getting from employees around equity, diversity, and inclusion. And specifically um, data that indicated that um, they did not see a strong um, leadership support of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And that became the metric that we really wanted to focus on. So I was able to take data from, um, from the employee listening sessions, from our recent employee engagement survey, um, and I was able to consult with, um, with the Colorado Equity Alliance and their subcommittees and bring all of this together to start shaping our approach to the work. So I, I felt very lucky to have all of those resources um, behind me as, as we started to move forward. 
Thanks, John. And John highlights some important pieces around, there were some existing structures, but also the mechanisms we put in place to get employee feedback. So he talked about the employer choice listening sessions. We had 45 different sessions across the state, met with 2,185 employees, and also set up a virtual site that they could participate and complete that online survey where we heard from another 1,254. And then John highlighted every other year in the state of Colorado, we do an employee engagement survey. And over half of our employees responded to it and gave us that metric that only 50% of them thought we were demonstrating equity, diversity, inclusion. So hearing from our employees as to what was important to them really shaped this strategic plan. And in another area was on growth and development. And maybe Tim, you can talk to us about what you're doing there. Yeah, thanks, Cara. I think the, you know, some of the, the key actions that helped us to identify uh, the opportunities for growth and development was the, you know, the, the really strong emphasis on collaboration. Um, you know, I've looked at uh, similar projects in other agencies, and Karin mentioned there's kind of this tendency, the easy way out is just to get the experts together and, and, and make a decision. Uh, but every step along the way, we went back to our customers and, and really emphasized collaboration. So we did this employee listening tour, uh, we went and, and, and had employee engagement data. Um, I was able to engage a, another group that I work with, the learning leaders, who are essentially the, the leaders of learning development across the state. And so we kept coming back to them with this data and, and, and really just asking them the question, what do you see? What are the trends? You know, what, what can we do to help facilitate uh, your goals as the agencies who are leading employee leading uh, learning and development? And you know, two big trends came out in, in the data. Um, one I'll talk to related to the EDI project that, that John mentioned is that you know, we recognized there was an opportunity to you know, increase the scope of EDI training or standardized understanding of EDI. And one of the things that we recognize is we didn't really have a single system in place. There wasn't one learning management system or one database that we could push the same training module out to all of the different you know, agencies and components and subunits within the state. And so one of the, the really kind of easy, it wasn't easy, it was easy to identify is like, hey, if we wanna have standardized understanding of EDI, then we need standardized systems. And so one of the big wins of this project since we started back in 2019 is we've been able to implement a system of learning management systems where there are some clusters with uh, groups of agencies using one set of systems, and then we have independent agencies using other sets of systems. And while it's not perfect, it does provide us what we needed to get this, this standardized message of EDI out to all these different customers. And um, it gives us some ground to start with. So I, I think that's one of the really big success stories uh, from where, we, where we've gone. Everything's sounding great so far, this kind of thriving Colorado team. but. You know, we, we are living in a society that is very split on opinions around um, one of those being EDI and the teaching of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And of course, there is differences between states and the federal level. Um, how are you, let's say to the skeptics around this in fellow agencies and employees, how have you made the business case for investing in making the state of Colorado an employer of choice, especially when the Denver job market is, is booming? I sort of throw that open to, to you all about what does that business case look like? Well, I think I, I'll jump in on that one because this is one of my favorite topics in the world. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it is it's so much fun for anybody who, who's got an interest in talent management and um, talent acquisition. Like in, any great recruiter loves a challenge. And the Colorado market is just such a fascinating place to be because it is tight. Um, you know, we, we have a ton of competition. We, we have a lot of talent at the same time. And, and I think that the, the fun and the joy in this work for me has been in working with our HR departments across the state to really understand what is that cycle? You know, what does a hiring cycle look like? What does sourcing look like for the state? Um, you know, throughout the, the whole employer of choice process, we heard from employees. And every single time you go out and you listen to employees, you realize what amazing stories we have to tell. We do amazing work. Anybody associated with state government, state is really the sweet spot because you can still see, touch, taste, feel 
the impact of your work and what you do when you're driving down the road and you see a sign for, you know, CDOT, like, you know, something about that. There's nowhere like it. And, and we have such an incredible mission that we, we can speak to. And we know that that's what today's job seekers are excited about. So our challenge is to figure out how do, how do we tell those stories in a consolidated way? How do we get out um, to the community, both from an EDI lens or otherwise? How, how do we, how do we, you know, really make ourselves known and position ourselves differently in the talent market. And of course, before COVID, we we were very excited to possibly get some funding to do this and work with ad agencies and have this brilliant campaign. And now there's no money, which just makes it more exciting because now it's a bigger challenge and a bigger puzzle. And I just couldn't be more excited to figure out how to do this for free. So okay, so this brings us to a practical point because we've talked a lot about the research and the findings. Let's talk about the execution of this. And so the, the big media budget went by the wayside because we may have some <laughs> other priorities to invest in. But, but you all kind of filled a gap here. And I think we can play in the background here some of the video reels that, that you put together. Was this produced in-house? But you know, this is where collaboration comes in again. There were a couple of folks who um, I was working with through the um, Equity Alliance and they said, you know what? I really, I know some people over at um, the, uh, the Office of Film and Television and our um, OEdit uh, agency. And I wanna talk to them about it because I think they would be interested in this. And you know, darn if they just weren't able to, through their relationships and talking up the project, make it happen. So. I don't know, Cara, anything that you wanted to add to that? Yeah, John, I think it's like thinking about how do we use state expertise differently, right? So you highlighted this. How do we use the Office of Economic Development to do an internal video for the state? How do we use the disability coordinator for labor and employment who focuses externally, using that expertise to help us become an employer of choice? So we're not looking in our silos or really reaching across the agencies to identify who has an accessibility coordinator for IT and grabbing that person and bringing them in instead of us doing our work by ourselves and really leveraging their subject matter expertise. And this is a great example of partnering with another agency. So Cara, let's stay on this sort of determination to get it done because it would have been easy to say, hey, the budgets are being cut. We're gonna drop this initiative. We hear stories across the corporate world of diversity and inclusion being taken seriously and then it just falling by the wayside when another shareholder priority comes in. From a, from a government, uh, government perspective, how did you keep this top of the agenda, particularly during a year like this fabulous 2020 we've all experienced? Sure, I think part of it is uh, we get to have the moral high ground sometimes at state government and we are best when we have a government that looks like the people we serve. And that driving force, regardless if it's in human services or transportation or economic development, bringing all of those ideas forward is helpful in the EDI perspective. Becoming employer of choice is a no brainer. We need great minds to do the hard work. Everyone watching this video knows government is not easy or we wouldn't be doing it. But we have such an incredible opportunity to make an impact and how do we bring people in to that um, is an easy sell. We always need great minds and great um, team members to join us. Uh, how we keep EDI, I. I was concerned about this too. We all kind of with the murder of George Floyd moved very quickly to uh, making this front and center and how do we not lose this? Uh, for us, one of the benefits and John worked uh, on this was getting our governor to sign an executive order directing the department to maintain this work because this is often work that falls aside during budget cuts. Um, and we have a very clear directive on things we should do in HR, on buildings, on websites, on documents. Um, in procurement as well on ADI. So I did notice as I watched that uh, video um, that there was a familiar face in that video. Was was that by was that by design and was it by, by design that a, a big deal wasn't made of that familiar face? You know, I think yes on on both counts. Um, it it was. Um, Actually, you know, our lieutenant governor is in the video as well. So we've got both the governor and lieutenant governor uh, making sort of surprise cameos. Um, and, you know, our lieutenant governor is very passionate um, around disability awareness and, and mental health and was very excited about participating. And, 
you know, as soon as we had her on board, you know, we said, well, we should probably uh, say something to the governor's office to see if he wants to participate. And he, and he absolutely did. And, um, and, and it was really wonderful to incorporate them in a way that didn't feel um, hierarchical or, or, or false, but rather um, it, more of creating community that we are all state employees. And to Cara's point, you know, um, what, what, what we're lucky to have behind us is that we are public servants. And when we say that we're serving the public, that means all of the public. And so regardless of where you are on, on the political spectrum, um, our job is to serve all of the public and to do that uh, in the best way we need to understand um, where they're coming from and be able to meet them where they are. And, that, and that's a big part of the EDI work that we're trying to do at the state. Okay, so that, so that was a large part of the messaging and how you got attention to this work. Cara, I'm gonna ask, ask you to maybe volunteer somebody here for this tough one, which is, so what are you actually doing to improve the EDI situation? We've, Tim's touched on training and we've talked about messaging of talent attraction, but you had several working groups that were looking at uh, compensation and benefits and opportunity and talent pathways and, and those type of things. So what are, the, what are the boots on the ground things that you're doing? And then how are you measuring success? Sure. Um, and EDI is just one portion of the strategic plan. So I'd love Clara, if we can, to jump in on her part. But with respect to EDI, um, what we are doing, obviously you've heard about the training that John and T Tim work together on so that every single state employee takes that training. Something we learned in communicating with other states and other agencies is what, what does good EDI training look like? So we talked to other states, we talked to Washington, we talked to Tennessee uh, and some other states out there. What was good, California as well. What, what's some good training that they were doing? Maybe Michigan as well. Um, and what we're hearing from the agencies as we continue to talk about them is how are they rolling this training out? So it's online training, but what we're hearing is best practices around after they take the training, small groups to discuss the training. So it's not just a one and done check the box compliance training, but really how do we dig a little deeper? That's just on the baseline training level. We are also working on setting accessibility standards for both our buildings, um, our websites and documents. So whether this is translation, uh, disability through visually impaired, videos through hearing impaired. And this is where John talked about bringing in the disability coordinator from labor and employment or bringing in the new America's leader from labor and employment on immigration and, and language issues um, to that place. We are also working on a disparity study. And I know many states out there are working on that. We just got our study back. It will be released to the public in December. So now it is implementing. The easy work is getting the study done. The hard work is making a difference with the results. Uh, so we are working on that as well. So from a from a candidate experience and employment branding standpoint, we're relooking really at our internal website because that's something that we can tr control in house. We can we can develop a statewide um, landing page that will get people who are job seekers, whether they're internal to the state and existing employees or external to the state. So that's sort of step one is, is figure that out because we can do that, we can do that in-house and we can do it pretty quickly. Another piece that we're really, really excited about is working on this idea of authentic community engagement. And the idea of authentic community engagement obviously has EDI tie-ins, but it also serves a, a sourcing purpose as well, all, all the way around. You know, how do, how do we really start working with the community groups that exist um, outside of ourselves that can connect us to job seekers? How, how can we begin a dialogue with them? How can we start asking the question of, you know, what are you looking for in your next job? What does that look like? What's attractive to you? And then we're going to turn around and we're going to do that internally as well and start to gain an understanding for um, the folks that work with the state. I mean, you can have nine careers and one employer working for the state of Colorado. Like the options are endless, but have we, have we done enough to explain to people um, about how to navigate that system once they're with us? You know, do they, do they understand that they need to apply, that somebody's not gonna just come and tap you on the shoulder for your next promotion? So we're, we're engaging in that work, um, using HR as a conduit and, and we'll start leveraging HR there. And then another, another piece that um, I guess goes back to EDI, but it, it's something that's really meaningful for me is this isn't a checklist. That is, this isn't, let's, let's go get some black engineers and hire them and call it good. 
right? We're not going to be done with this. We're taking a slow path. We're asking people to actually change and transform. And that's going to be a, a longer haul across the board. And, um, you know, it's been very interesting working specifically with the HR community and giving them some space. We've had a number of open freeform calls statewide where we said, come in, take off your title. We're all here as people. And then we were able to sort of facilitate these growth conversations to say, none of us have arrived, right? N none of us know how to do this. We're, we're all wandering in the woods to some extent in our in our pathway um, when it comes to EDI. But, but being able to be human and, and really convey to people that this is, we're asking for long-term change. Like this is truly transformative. That's been very, very exciting um, as well. All right, last, last question for, for each of you. Um, so for your peers in the other 49, states and the territories, what would your recommendations be from your personal experience in terms of getting a program like this done, making their states and territories the employer of choice in their regions? First, we'd like them not to do that because we don't right. want them to hire our employees away. So <laughs> first, there's that. Um, <laughs> um, I think it's really listening, right? So listening to employees. Lots of states do employee engagement um, surveys, but there was something very different about going and talking to employees, where we gave them the opportunity to, every time we had a session, we heard about an idea that we had never thought of. And it was really in reaching to the employees that brought us all kinds of great ideas to execute on and really develop those themes that then became the six thematic areas. Because my, my lens is HR, right? I, I work for the HR community, but but having those relationships established in, in advance. And we spent a lot of time doing a lot of intentional relationship resetting, mm -hmm. knowing that we had a big couple of years and this was before COVID. So just going into employer of choice and some of the other initiatives we were pursuing, we, we are a small department um, compared, compared to what other states have access to. And so we have to leverage the relationships we have, which means having those relationships and being willing to take some shots and going out and saying, you know, we've made a huge shift, um, in Cara's time with DHR and DPA from being like the mandator and the gavel holder and the thou shalt, you know, dictum provider, um, and, and really, really flipping that on the side and, and seeing ourselves as a support. We, we are customer service. We are here to support the work of the field. You know, I really believe that when HR is done well, HR is a connector. That's our value add. We help connect um, brilliant people and great ideas and resources, and we glue them together. And so I have to know our HR teams really, really well so that we can start plugging them in, right? <laughs> and saying, hey, you know, we don't have money to buy an evaluation person, but I think that Department of Public Health and Environment probably has a whole field. Who do we need to talk to to get access to this talent? You know, I think uh, to build off of what Clara uh, was saying, you know, you never, you never really know where there is a combination of talent and passion out there. And it's been building those relationships and you meet somebody who just has that fire and, and you say, well, gosh, you know, I, I'm working on this initiative. Any chance that you'd want to participate and, you know, be part of this? And they say, oh, man, absolutely. And then all of a sudden you're off and running. And it's in having those um, collaborative conversations. Cara, a final question for you. Three to five years from now, if you're observing state government, how will you know and feel that this initiative to make the state of Colorado an employer of choice has been successful? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. We will know because people will want to work for the state government. Like when I meet someone and hey, say, hey, I work for state government, they'll say, oh, really? Tell me more. Tell me how I can apply for a job. I, I've heard they do X, Y, and Z, and I'm interested in all of them. That's how we will know. And of course, we have some metrics around applications and uh, that, but really we'll know because the, our neighbors will want to come work for the state just like we